In this lecture, we shall discuss the modifications of the common law rules on consideration. By Ghana's Contract Act of 1960, Act 25. By Ghana's Contract Act of 1960, Act 25. Now, do you recall that in our previous lecture, we defined what consideration is, and then we discussed a number of principles governing consideration. You remember we indicated that consideration need not be adequate, but it must be sufficient. And over here, what we meant was that the courts will not delve into the bargain of the parties to decide for the parties what the actual value of a particular consideration is supposed to be. So we indicated that as far as the law is concerned, when parties agree on something which is of value, which the law recognizes to be a valid form of consideration, the court will not interfere to say that this consideration is too cheap as compared to what the other party is getting from the other party. So we know consideration need not be adequate, but it must be sufficient. By sufficient, it means that whatever is in question must qualify to be something which in law, the law recognizes as a valid form of consideration. Now, it will interest you to know that under the common law, there were some conducts which did not amount to valid forms of consideration. There were some conducts which did not amount to good consideration. There were some conducts which did not amount to sufficient consideration. So it is good that we see these particular conducts which did not amount to sufficient consideration under the common law and indicate and explain why the common law did not recognize such conduct as valid forms of consideration. And then we shall also indicate how these rules have been modified by Ghana's Contract Act of 1960 as 25. In other words, there are rules under the common law, which have indicated that some particular conduct will not amount to valid forms of consideration. But in Ghana, they shall amount to valid forms of consideration. In Ghana, they shall amount to sufficient consideration because of reforms that have been introduced by Ghana's Contract Act of 1960, Act 25. Now, the first point I shall discuss relates to promises made by an offeror to keep an offer open for acceptance for a specified period of time. You remember when we were dealing with offer and acceptance, that a person can make an offer to a particular person, that I hereby offer my vehicle to you for sale at the price of 5,000 cities. And this offer shall remain open for the next five weeks. Now, I made the offer that I'm offering my car to you for sale at 5,000 CDs. And I accompany the offer with the promise that I will keep the offer open for you to accept within a period of six weeks. Now, let us say that in the third week, under the common law, insofar as you have not given me any form of consideration to keep this promise open for the six weeks, insofar as you have not, you have not paid me anything, you have not given me anything of value, which is supposed to bind me to keep the promise open for six weeks, under the common law, I can revoke the offer at any time before acceptance. 
means that under the common law, a promise made by Mount Ferro that he shall keep an offer open for acceptance for a specified period of time, that promise shall not be binding against the offer law unless the offeree has provided some form of consideration for the promise. So let's say I make a and common law, if I make a promise to you that I'm offering my house for sale and I promise to keep this offer, offer open for six months, the common law is expecting that you will pay me some commitment or you will give me something of value which will bind me to keep the offer open for six months. But if you haven't given me anything that will bind me for the six months period, under the common law, that promise will not be binding on the offer law. And the offer law can always revoke the offer. The offer law can sell the house to a different person in the second month and the first offer cannot do anything about it. This is the common law rule that a promise made by an offer law. But he shall keep an offer open for acceptance for a specified period of time. That promise shall not be binding against the offer unless the offer has provided some form of consideration. And this common law position is evidenced in the case of Rootsleg and Grant. Rootsleg is spelled R O U T L E D G E. Rutledge versus Grant. Grant is G R A N T. So we pronounce them Rutledge and Grant. 1828, 113 land reports at page 920. That is the common law position. But this position has been modified by Ghana's contracts out of 1960 at 25. Section 81. Of Ghana's contract act of 1960 at 25 provides that if you go and make a promise to keep an offer open for a specified period of time, let's say about eight months, and the other party has not given any form of consideration, according to Ghana's contract act, that promise shall be binding on you and it shall not become unenforceable merely because the other party has failed to provide some form of consideration. In other words, in Ghana, when you make a promise to keep an offer open for acceptance for a specified period of time, and there's some evidence, there is some evidence that the offeree accepted that promise to make to keep the offer open for eight months, for 10 months, for 12 months, if there's some evidence that the offeree accepted that promise you made to keep the offer open for eight months, then the promise you made to keep the offer open for acceptance, that promise shall not be invalid merely because the other party has failed to provide some form of consideration. It means that in Ghana, when you make an offer, and you accompany it with a promise to keep the offer open for acceptance, that promise you have made to keep the offer open for acceptance, it shall be binding against the offeror. And it shall not be invalid merely because the offeree has not provided any form of consideration. And so the language of Section H1 of the Contract Act of 1960 at 25 is as follows. A promise to keep an offer open for acceptance for a specified time shall not be invalid as a contract by reason only of the absence of consideration thereof. So that is the modification to the common law rule that was laid down in root legend grant. So remember that the common law was that a promise to keep an offer open for acceptance for a specified period of time, that promise shall not be binding against the offeror or the promisor in the absence of consideration flowing from the promisee. But in Ghana, Section 8, Subsection 1 of the Contract Act of 1960, 
Act 25 has modified its common law position. Now, to demonstrate this particular exception very well, I shall refer you to the Memorandum to the Contract Act of 1960, Act 25. To demonstrate and explain this section H1 very well, the explanatory memorandum to the Contract Act of 1960, Act 25 had the following illustration. And I read. A offers to sell his house to B for an amount and say that the offer will remain open for one week. Before the week expires, A sells the house to X. Provided that there's some evidence from which a court can infer that B has accepted A's promise to keep the offer open, not the offer to sell the house. B will have an action against A for breach of this contract. Emphasis. Provided that there is some evidence from which a court can infer that B has accepted A's promise to keep the offer open, not the offer to sell the house, B will have an action against A for breach of this contract. So you, the promise, so you yourself made the promise to keep the offer open for eight months. If there's an, if there's some evidence that I have accepted this promise you have made to me to keep the offer open for eight months, then the law says that that promise you made to keep the offer open for eight months it shall be binding on you, even though I have not provided any form of consideration for that particular promise. That is the full import of Section 81 of the Contract Act of 1960, Act 25. The next rule we shall look at relates to the past payment of a debt. Now, this is a very interesting provision. Now, at common law, if a debtor is owing a creditor. And the creditor says that you are owing me $5,000. Pay me $2,000 today. And I shall waive the outstanding $3,000. At common law, if the debtor pays the $2,000, and later on, the Creditor decides to sue the debtor for the outstanding $3,000. The common law recognizes that the debtor may say that, are you not the one yourself who agreed with me that you are waiving the outstanding $3,000? Because I remember I was owing you $5,000 and you told me that you are waiving $3,000 and that I should pay $2,000 in full satisfaction of my indebtedness to you. So the question that I rose in the common law was whether when a person makes a promise that he is waiving or foregoing the past payment of a debt. And like I said in this case, a person making the promise that he is waiving the $3,000. So the common law's position was to find out whether a promise to waive or to forego the past payment of a debt, whether that promise to waive or forego the part payment of the debt, whether it shall be binding against the promisor, even though there may be no consideration flowing from the promisee. Now, this is a quite interesting provision because under the common law, when you are owing me $5,000 and I say pay me $2,000 and I shall waive the $3,000, that promise is not binding on me. Meaning that I could always come back to you and tell you that, my friend, give me back my money. And you cannot tell me that, that I made an earlier promise that I shall not sue you to enforce the remaining $3,000. A common law, a promise made by a creditor to waive or to forego the past payment of a debt 
that promise to weave or to forego, it shall not be binding against the promisor unless there is some form of consideration flowing from the promisee. A common law, a promise to waive or to forego the part payment of a debt, that promise shall not be binding against the promisor unless there is some consideration flowing from the promisee. So if you are saying that I have waived three thousand dollars, show me what you have done for me. Show me what you have done for me as consideration to merit me waiving that three thousand dollars. If you haven't done anything under the common law, that promise to waive or to forego the part payment of the debt shall not be binding on the promisor, and the promisor can always sue you to recover the amount he promised to waive. This rule, which is of great import in the common law, was laid down in the case popularly referred to as the Pendle's case. Pendle is spelled P I N N E L, apostrophe S. Pendle's case. It was reported as far back as near 1602. That case laid down the position that a promise to waive or to forego the part payment of a debt. That promise shall not be binding on the promisor unless there is some form of consideration flowing from the promisee. And this rule that was laid down in the penal case has also been affirmed in the case of Fox versus Beer. Fox is spelled F O A K E S. Fox versus Beer. Beer is B W E R. Reported in the year 1884. Appeals cases at page 605. Now I shall read out the facts of this case and highlight to you how it relates to this particular principle. Now, the brief facts of this case are that the plaintiff in this case actually was someone that the defendant was indebted to, to an amount of money about 2,090 pounds. Now, in order for the, and this, this indebtedness arose when the plaintiff sued the defendant in the high court and obtained judgment against the defendant for this amount of 2,090 pounds together with interest. You know, usually when you go to court and you win judgment against a person, the court will ask you to recover from this person the principal sum of £2,090 together with interest from the date of default or something to the date of final payments. You know those things. So the plaintiff in this case had already brought an action against the defendant in the high court and obtained that meant for a principal sum of about £2,090 together with interest. Now, the plaintiff in this case entered into an agreement with the defendant to pay the debt. And they gave an instrumental plan on how the defendant can be paying the money. That he should pay 500 pounds immediately, pay 150 pounds on occasions, and keep on paying it in installments until the whole sum of the 2,090 pounds has been paid. So the defendant is owing £2,090 together with interest. But the plaintiff has entered into an agreement with the defendant. Like, you know what? Pay £500 immediately. Then, with respect to the balance, be paying £150 on two occasions in each year. Keep on doing this until the full amount of the £2,090 has been paid. Now, the critical thing that you should note about this agreement in Fox and BI is that they did not cater for the payment of the interest when they were settling the debts. So the defendant also paid the full amount. But after he paid it, the plaintiff then went to sue, claiming the interest, and say that the agreement they entered into didn't cater for the interest. Even while he had gone to sign an agreement saying that he's going to accept payment of the debt, 
by paying the principal and paying the outstanding debt in installments until the full amount has been pledged. Now, the defendant has gone ahead to pay the very amount that was mentioned in the agreement. That is the £2,090. Now, you, the plaintiff, you are saying that they are coming to announce you for interest. Meanwhile, in the agreement you signed, you didn't mention that you are taking interest. So, the question was, that agreement the plaintiff has signed, where he had agreed more or less to waive or to forego the part payment, in this case, agreed to waive the interest that was outstanding, whether that agreement was binding and enforceable against the promissor. The court held that the defendants had not provided any form of consideration for the promise to waive the outstanding interest. They haven't provided any form of consideration. Have you gone to punish his shoe? Have you gone to paint his house? Have you gone to give him something? You haven't given any form of consideration for that promise to waive the part payment of that debt. And so that promise to waive or to forego the part payment of that debt, that interest, it shall not be binding against the plaintiff. And so the court held that the plaintiff could still sue to recover the part payment of that debt. This is the common law rule on part payment of a debt. It says that when a promise is made by a person to waive or forego the part payment of a debt under the common law, that promise shall not be binding against the promisor unless there's some consideration flowing from the promisee. And this is supported by the case of Pinnell's case as well as Fuchs and Beer. Now, this rule has been modified by Ghana's Contract Act of 1960, Act 25. It has been modified by Section 8, Subsection 2 of the Contract Act of 1960, Act 25. And this is what Section 8, Subsection 2 of Act 25 says, and I quote, A promise to waive the payment of a debt or part of a debt or the performance of some other contractual or legal obligation shall not be invalid as a contract by reason only of the absence of consideration, therefore. I'll take it three times. So the second time, I promise to waive the prior payment of a debt or a part of a debt or the performance of some other contractual or legal obligation shall not be invalid as a contract by reason only of the absence of any consideration, therefore. Again, a promise to waive the payment of a debt or parts of a debt or the performance of some other contractual or legal obligation shall not be invalid as a contract by reason only of the absence of consideration, therefore. What is Section 8 to tell us? It's telling us that in Ghana, when you make a promise, to waive or to forego the part payment of the debt, that promise shall not be invalid as a contract merely because there is no consideration flowing from the other party. That promise to waive or forego the part payment of a debt, that promise shall not be invalid merely because the other party has failed to provide any form of consideration. It means that in Ghana, when you make a promise and you are waiving the part payment of the debt, that promise you are making, it shall be binding against you, even though the other party has not provided any form of consideration. This is the second modification that has been introduced by Ghana's Contract Act 1960 at 25 in the Common Law Rules of Causation. To discuss two modifications so far, first is that we have indicated that a promise to keep an offer open for acceptance under the common law. That promise shall not be binding against the promisor unless there's some consideration flowing from the promisee. Over there, we said it was laid down in the case of Rutledge and Grant, and we said that it has been modified by Section 8, 
Staff Section 1 of the Contract Act of 1960 and 25. Look at the next rule that under the common law, a promise to waive or forego the part payment of a debt, that promise shall not be binding against the promisor unless there's some fresh consideration flowing from the promisee. And we said this common law rule has been laid down in the Penel's case and has also been applied in the case of Fuchs and Beer. We have seen how it has been modified by Section 8, Subsection 2 of the Contract Act of 1960, Act 25. So we have two exceptions so far. Two modifications. Let's move on to the third one. Now, now, now in the common law, there are some considerations we refer to as pre-existing legal obligations. And let me explain this. It could be that I am a teacher in the university. Or it could be that I am a, yeah, I'm a teacher in the university and then I have entered into an agreement with the students or the university to lecture them for a semester. It means that I'm under an existing contractual obligation. I owe the students a contractual obligation to perform a particular duty to them. So since I owe them a particular duty already, now when those students come and promise me that they are going to pay me $5,000 as consideration for me to teach them that same course. Remember, this is the same course that I owe the obligation to the students to lecture them because I'm a lecturer in the university. So I'm under an existing obligation to already provide the lectures to them. Now I'm going to enter into another agreement with them where I'm agreeing to render that same service to them for them to pay me $5,000. Not sometimes it happens. Go to some places. The lecturer will say that my friend, today, if you don't pay me this amount of money, I'm not going to lecture you. And if you don't pay me, you'll go and feel that people will contribute and come and pay the lecturer. Now, when the lecturer now goes to sue the students for that amount of money, the question will be whether the lecturer has provided some good consideration for that particular promise. Have the lecturer provided any form of good consideration for that particular promise? Now, the law is that when you perform an existing obligation, something you are already bound to perform, the performance of a pre-existing obligation, you are already bound to even teach them in the first place. So the performance of that pre-existing obligation it shall not in law amount to sufficient consideration for another promise. In other words, by virtue of the fact that the lecturer was already bound to perform that obligation to the students, the performance of that pre-existing legal obligation shall not suffice as a valid form of consideration that will support the enforcement of the promise against the people, the students who promised him that they will pay him $5,000 for teaching him. So under the common law, a promise a person makes to perform a pre-existing legal obligation that shall not amount to sufficient consideration for another promise. A common law, the performance of a pre-existing legal obligation, the performance of a pre-existing legal obligation shall not amount to a valid form of consideration to support the enforcement of another promise. So the example I gave relates to pre-existing obligations owed to the promisor. There are different, different types of these pre-existing legal obligations. It could be a pre-existing legal obligation owed to the promisor. So the example I gave of the lecturer already owing a duty to the students. So this is a pre-existing legal duty owed to the promisor. Now, in this case, 
when the lecturer performs that obligation of going to lecture, what you're already bound to do, that performance of that pre-existing legal obligation shall not amount to good consideration that will support the enforcement of a promise. So let me give another example. Let's say that a, a, a carpenter has, you have entered into a contract with a carpenter to construct maybe some windows for you at a price of $100,000. Maybe it's for a full hotel apartment, $100,000. And you're supposed to finish the contract within five months. In the fourth month, when you realize the, all your guests were coming, he says that, my friend, if you don't promise to pay me an extra $50,000, I will not finish this work. And if I don't finish at this point, I know you don't have money to go and get any other person. And you know the amount of money you stand to lose if you don't complete it. So you sign, you sign another agreement where you agree to pay an extra $50,000 to the carpenter. Now, when the carpenter finishes the construction of the wardrobes, the question will be whether he can sue you to enforce that extra $50,000 that you promised him. The law will say that the performance of that obligation, the constructing of the work groups, that obligation was something that the carpenter already owed you a duty to perform. So the performance of that pre-existing legal obligation it shall not amount to a valid form of consideration to enforce that promise you made to pay the extra $50,000. The performance of that consideration of constructing the wardrobes, the carpenter was already bound to perform that obligation. So since he was already bound, he cannot perform what was already bound to support the enforcement of that promise he made to pay the extra fifty thousand dollars. So at common law, the performance of a pre-existing legal obligation owed to the promisor shall not amount to good consideration. Another way it can also arise. Is pre existing obligation imposed by the law. So let's say you're a public officer, or the law is the one that is imposing that particular duty on you. Let's say you're a police officer, and the law has already imposed upon you a duty to protect somebody. So if you look at the case of Collins and Godfrey, for example, in that case, a person has been subpoenaed to come and testify in court to give evidence. I've been subpoenaed. And you know, in law, once a subpoena has been served on you, it is mandatory for you to go and testify. As a matter of fact, if you don't go, you begin to be in contempt of court. So a, con a subpoena has been served on somebody to appear in court to testify. But a party to the case told that person that, my friend, if you will come and testify, I promise to pay you an amount of money because I need your evidence as a matter of crucial importance. So this person has already been served with a writ of subpoena and was already bound to go and enter the box and testify. But because I also need this evidence, I said, I'm a friend, go and testify so that I'll pay you. The person who goes to testify, comes out, now decides to sue to enforce the promise I made to him to pay that amount of money. Now, court will hold under the common law that what you went to perform, that testifying you went to testify, you were already bound to go and perform it. The law had already imposed a duty upon you to go and perform it. So if you're going to perform what you're already bound to do, something that law is already imposing on you, you cannot use that one as a basis to sue me to enforce the promise I made to you to pay you $5,000. So under the common law, the performance of a pre-existing legal or public duty shall not amount to valid form of consideration. It shall not amount to sufficient consideration. And so... The common law is that the performance of a pre-existing legal or public duty shall not amount to good consideration. So you are a police officer. You are already bound to protect me. I tell you, police, help me arrest this person. That is your duty already. If I promise to pay you 5,000 CDs, if you help me arrest the person, if you can arrest the person and now want to sue me for that 5,000 CDs, the law is that the performance of a pre-existing legal or public duty, that performance shall not amount to a valid form of consideration that will enforce, that will support the enforcement of the promise I made to you. So over there, look at the case of Collins and Godfrey, and also look at Glassbrook Brothers Limited versus La Morgan County Council.
the 1925 accused cases at 2270. The third legal obligation, pre-existing legal obligation, is a pre-existing legal obligation owed to a third party. So there are times when I already owe an obligation to a third party. Let's say I owe the obligation to a company I work with to help locate a particular item. Let's say an item is lost and I work with an insurance company and I've been assigned with the responsibility of locating that particular lost item. So this is an obligation I owe to the insurance company. And let's say a, to a total stranger, somebody who's not working with my company, you're not a director of my company, you also come to me, come, come and tell me that you are challenging me. If I can find this particular lost item, you will pay me $5,000. Now, what you've come to promise me about that lost item you want me to go and find, find. This is something that I'm already bound. I'm already contracted bound to my insurance company to help locate it. So this is an obligation I already owe to my company. But you, the stranger, you have come to also promise me that you also pay me an amount of money if I can help, if I can find that same chattel. Now, this creates a scenario of a pre-existing obligation I owe to a third party. So let's say, for purpose of example, my company is called Onya Insurance Company Limited. Onya Insurance Company Limited. And I'm called Kofi. And you are called Ama. So there are three parties involved. The insurance company is Onya Insurance Company Limited. Me, the staff over there, I'm called Kofi. And you, the third party, the stranger, you are called Ama. So I already have an agreement or I already owe an obligation to the insurance company to help locate the missing vehicle. Then you, a third party, a stranger, you come and tell me that I should help you find the same vehicle because you want to use the vehicle for a photo shoot. Now, between Kofi and Amma, between you, Kofi and Amma, this promise you've come to make to, this promise that this agreement you've entered into, where I'm supposed to help you locate the vehicle, this is an obligation I already owe to a third party, which is on your insurance company limited. So under the common law, there has been questions about whether the performance of a pre-existing legal duty that you owe to a third party, the, the performance of a pre-existing legal duty that I owe to a third party, in this case, Onya Insurance Company Limited, whether that performance can be put in consideration to support the promise that Amma made to me. In other words, if I have a look at the vehicle, can I sue Amma to recover the $5,000 she promised me? If I sue her, can she tell me that? But after all, I was already bound to my insurance company limited to locate the vehicle. Under the common law, the performance of a pre-existing legal duty owed to a third party amounts to a valid form of consideration. It amounts to sufficient consideration to support the enforcement of a promise. And this is evident in the case of Shadow versus Shadow. Shadow is not S H A W S H A G W E L L. Shadow versus Shadow, reported as far back as in the year 1860. So, under the common law, the performance of a pre existing legal duty owed to a third party amounts to good consideration. So, we've seen three kinds of pre existing legal duties under the common law. One is a pre existing legal duty owed to the promisor. And under the common law, it will not amount to good consideration. Again, a pre existing legal or public duty under the common law, it will not amount to good consideration. The only one that will amount to good consideration is a pre existing legal duty owed to a third party. That one will amount to a valid form of consideration. Now, there has been a modification done to this provision under the Ghana's Contract Act of 1960, Act 25, by Section 9. Remember, like we said, the general position under the common law is that a promise a person makes to perform a pre-existing legal obligation, that performance shall not amount to sufficient consideration for another promise. How has Section 9 modified this common law position? Section 9 says that the performance of an act or the promise to perform an act 
may be sufficient consideration for another promise, notwithstanding that the performance of that act may already be enjoined by some legal duty, whether enforceable by the other party or not. Again, the performance of an act or the promise to perform an act may be sufficient consideration for another promise, notwithstanding that the performance of that act may already be enjoined by some legal duty, whether enforceable by the other party or not. So it means under section 9 of Ghana's Contract Act of 1960 at 25, the performance of a duty that you are already bound to perform, the performance of that obligation, it shall suffice as good consideration, even though you are already bound by law to perform that particular duty. There's a Ghanaian case that I can I invite you to look at. It's the Ghanaian case of Kesi. Kesi versus Shaman. Kesi versus Shaman. Kesi is what? K-E-S-S-I-E -S 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 -E versus Shaman. Shaman is what? C-H-A-R-M-A-N-T. Kesi versus Shaman and another is reported in 1973. Two Ghana law reports at page 194. Kesi versus Shaman. So this is another modification done to the common law rules on consideration by section 9 of Ghana's Contract Act of 1960 at 25. Then the next one we shall look at is the common law rule that says that consideration must move from the promisee. As we've seen in the case of Twedo and Atkinson. Twedo, Twedo is spelled T-W-E-D-D-L-E, Twedo. But it's Atkinson. Atkinson is what A T K I N S O N. Twedo versus Atkinson, reported in 1861. Now these are the facts of Twedo and Atkinson that you can get from the case book written by Joe Fu on contract law. Now pay critical attention to the names. Don Twedo and William Guy. They each agreed to pay a sum of money to the plaintiff in consideration of the plaintiff marrying Guy's daughter. So Don Tredon and Vinam Guy, they are the respective fathers of plaintiff and then the, the husband and then the bride. So two people are going to marry and their father, their respective father, father in laws. They each agreed to pay an amount of money to the plaintiff. That is widow son. If Twedo will go ahead and marry Guy's daughter. But Guy refused to pay the amount of money. And then Twedo to sued the executor. And my friend, these two people, these two fathers, they all agree that they will pay me an amount of money. Guy, he doesn't want to pay. So I'm suing you as an executor. Pay me the money. Now pay critical attention to the case. The, the, the promise was made by the two fathers. The father of the, of the man and the father of the woman. Now, what consideration did this son? What did he provide for this? He didn't provide anything. The agreement to pay him that amount of money, it was for his benefit, but he didn't provide any consideration for it. He was just there and he said, they will pay you this amount of money. But he had not provided anything of value to, for, for that particular promise. So the court held that since consideration had not moved from the promisee, the promisee over here is the person for whose benefit the promise is made. So the person for whose benefit the promise is made in this case is the, the groom, the husband. So the court that he has not provided any form of consideration. So he cannot sue to enforce that promise to give him that amount of money. So take those. The promise in this case is the person for whose benefit the promise is made. Two fathers agree that they will pay you the son. The son, what have you done to marry that amount of money? You haven't given anything in return. So it's a promise that makes you. So the person for whose benefit the promise is made in this case is the one we call the promisee. The court is saying that since that son did not provide any form of consideration, then he could not see you to enforce that promise. That is why we say under the common law that consideration must move from the promisee. Then under the common law, consideration must move from the promisee. And we see that in Twedel. Versus Atkinson. This rule has been modified by Section 10 of Ghana's Contract Act 
of 1960 at 25. And what does it say? It says that no promise shall be invalid as a contract by reason only that the consideration for it is supplied by some other than the promisee. That no permit shall be invalid as a contract by reason only that the consideration for it is supplied by some other person than the promisee. It means that if two people agree to confer benefit on me, even though I, the promisee, am not the one that has provided the consideration, even though I haven't provided any consideration, I'm not the one who provided the consideration, I can still sue you to enforce that promise. That is the case of Section 10 of Ghana's Contract Act of 1960, Act 25. That says that no permit shall be invalid as a contract merely because the consideration for it is applied by someone other than the promisee. In other words, consideration need not move from the promisee in Ghana. So, what we have done so far in this lecture is that we have identified the reforms that have been introduced into the common law rules of consideration by Ghana's contracts out of 1960 at 25. We started our discussion by referring to the common law rule we saw in Woodland and Grants that indicated that a promise made to keep an offer open for acceptance for a specified time that promise shall not be binding on the promisor in the absence of consideration flowing from the promisee. And we said this has been modified by Section 8 of Section 1 of Ghana's Contract Act of 1960, Act 25. We went ahead to look at Section 8 of Section 2, which indicates that under the common law, under the com which uh, uh, modified the common law position, because under the common law, what we saw in Pennell's case, and folks and beer is that when you make a promise to waive or to forego the part payment of the debt, under the common law, that promise is not binding against you, the promisor, unless there's some consideration flowing from the promisee. That's what we saw in Fox and Beer and the penal case. And we said that have been modified by Section 8, Subsection 2 of Ghana's Contract Act of 1960 and 25. And then we went ahead to look at the performance of a pre existing legal obligation. The performance of a pre existing legal obligation. Now, for the performance of a pre existing legal obligation, remember we said that under the common law, generally, generally, the performance of a pre existing legal obligation shall not amount to sufficient consideration. I have seen how that has been modified by Section 9 of Ghana's Contract Act of 1960 and 25. And the final modification we looked at was the case of Twiddle and Askinson, which case emphasized that consideration must move from the promisee. And we've seen how that has been modified by Section 10 of Ghana's contract out of 1960.